this is the book, you guys. It's called um, Total Forgiveness. Hang on, don't don't panic. I'm gonna share my screen with you. Hold on. Okay, so here it is. Hopefully, you guys can see that on your screen. Can you guys see that? I can't hear you, but shake your heads. I can see you. Okay, this curriculum we got um, from R.T. Kendall. He wrote this book. Man, I highly, highly recommend this book. So you can get it on Amazon. Make sure you get it on Amazon Smile, you guys, because matter of fact, do all your holiday shopping on Amazon Smile because um, you can donate to your favorite nonprofit or Strong Tower. It's a really good way to be able to be uh, philanthropic without it costing you anything. Amazon does it for you. So it's really cool. If you read the book, you'll find that it mirrors what we're going to be talking about um, quite a bit. So uh, like I said, I, I want to make sure that RT gets all the, all the credit. Um, of course, nobody's got the corner on truth, but um, this was his material, and we really, really appreciate uh, his ministry and, and what he's doing. I'll be dropping scripture references and maybe copying and pasting some things that I think are important. But everything that um, you really need is in your study guide. And you'll also need some kind of journal. You're going to need a journal during this class. Okay, so let's get started. Can you learn to forgive? So, Father, we just thank you right now in the name of Jesus um, that you would speak to us today. Uh, Lord, we thank you for these opportunities where we could get together and have meetings like this. Um, what a gift technology can be. And so we thank you for it. And we trust you, uh, God, to speak to our lives as we as we hone in and dig in. I pray that you'd help us to go beyond uh, the distance that's between us and that it would feel like we were in the same room, God, that, that we would be able to um, link together and grow together in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, so here we go. Forgiveness is one of the greatest self-disciplines that, that we have to learn. And unforgiveness not only hurts your soul, but it can actually cause you physical harm. I, I don't know if you guys knew that, but um, you know, unforgiveness can actually uh, cause problems within the body. Like medical science has proven that, um, that unforgiveness leads to bitterness, and bitterness leads to all kinds of things like cancers, um, and, you know, stress, obviously stress is a huge killer. Uh, so you, you want to do your best to keep stress out of your life or minimize stress in your life. And, you know, I, not only did God tell you to forgive, but now we've got all these physical reasons that we should forgive as well, because just carrying unforgiveness is a burden to you. It's, it's a weight that you carry on your shoulders and God never intended for us to carry that kind of weight, and it can cause you physical harm. It also, and in my opinion, what's worse than even physical harm, it can actually hinder your relationship with God. And to me, that's that's more than enough. You know, like I don't I don't need any more incentive uh, to walk out forgiveness if somebody's like, "Hey, this is getting in the way of your relationship with God." I'm like, "All right, I'm in. Let's let's get rid of that, right?" Because I don't want anything between me and God. Look, you guys, life is hard enough as it is, right? So I don't need to make things harder. I don't need to compound my issues by um, putting God at arm's length from me. So this is really good incentive. But the thing is, is that you, you have to learn how to forgive. It doesn't, it doesn't come naturally to any of us. Forgiveness is, is a practice. Um, I might even say it's a bit of an art, uh, it takes time, it takes intentionality, it takes energy, you're going to fail at it, you're going to bomb some days, you're going to really succeed some days, and um, it just, it takes time, it takes practice, and you have to be willing to go through the process and, and go through the practice of it, or uh, it will always be something that eludes you. So let's first talk about woundedness, right, wounded Christians, and I think we can all agree that hurt people hurt people. And, and, and so we recognize that um, people get hurt in this life, and, and out of that response comes more hurt, right? It's like, you know, trying to, um, and uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not comparing people to dogs, but it's like, you know, if a dog was caught in a snare and, and you went to try to help it, um, you know, it's looking at you like, hey, I'm in pain, and please help me, but if you try to touch it, the chances are it's going to bite you, right? Because it, it's, you know, it, it, it's a natural reaction. It's, same is true uh, among humans. Most of us have experienced times in our lives when we're pushed beyond our limits to forgive. 
right? And God allows some of that because this journey is to become more like Christ. And that's part of it for us, like learning how to forgive, learning how to walk this very important piece of godliness out in our lives. And so God will often allow us to experience things, as terrible as it is, um, that we would have to exercise this ability or this discipline to forgive because you have to remember that God's chief end is not our comfort. It's our growth. God wants us to grow beyond ourselves. And so most of us, I, I would say, if you haven't yet, buckle up because it's going to happen. You're going to get pushed beyond the point where you feel like you can forgive somebody. Somebody's going to do something so heinous and so terrible to you that you're going to feel like, that's it. I can't do that. That's unforgivable. And unfortunately, some Christians lag behind in the area of forgiveness. No one is immune from the impossible to forgive situations in life. We all deal with with these situations in life that just feels absolutely impossible. And sometimes the hurt runs so deeply that it affects every area of our personal life and even our sense of self-worth. It's just crazy. Now, Job and King David are two individuals in the Bible, and they weren't shy about explaining how they felt. So in Job 3.26, you guys want me to write this stuff in the in the dialogue? Um, Job 3... 26, there's a scripture reference for you. Um, maybe I'll just copy and paste some, because I have a Bible open on my screen, so I'll just copy and paste it over there. How's that? Um, that might make it easier for you guys. That way you can read it with me. Okay, so Job 3.26 says, I am not at ease, nor am I quiet, and I'm not at rest, but turmoil comes. So Job's like, man, I'm in turmoil. Uh, and, and important, like, there will be times in our lives where we'll be feeling turmoil, experiencing turmoil. Uh, and then in Psalm 143 and in verse 7, it says, answer me quickly, Lord, my spirit fails. This is King David going, man, I'm like, Ugh, I'm feeling like, he's <laughs> like, my spirit fails. He says, do not hide your face from me or it will be the same as those who go down into the pit. So he's talking about this like high, high level of despair. So those who are brought situations those who brought those kind of situations upon you like this, that make you feel this way, here, this is an important piece, you guys. I want you to catch this. People who have made you feel like Job and King David, are you guys, look at those scriptures. People who have made you feel that way, it is likely that they have no idea what you went through. It's likely that they have, it, it's likely that it wasn't intentional um, maybe their action was intentional, but how you felt the response that, that it caused in you wasn't intentional. So it's likely that they have no idea what you went through. And we should pray that they never will. We should pray that they never have to experience what we experienced. If you guys can relate to Job and to King David in, in these scriptures over here, we should pray that nobody has to relate to that. Now, the reality is at some point in their life they will, but uh, we, we don't want to wish that on people. Here are the most important words you may ever hear. You guys ready? You must forgive them. You must. Until you totally forgive them, you will be in chains. Not them, you. Release them, and you will be released. Now, when I say that, I understand because hurt runs deep, you guys. I, I get it. What I just said, it might, it might make you angry. It might make you feel anxiety. It might make you feel pressured. It might make you feel trapped. But I'm telling you, this is a pivotal moment for you. It's a pivotal moment. It might seem like an unreasonable request. You might be like, Pastor, you don't know what these people have done to me. You don't know what this person did. You don't know how it made me feel. It ran so deep. It, was, it cut me so deep. I'm telling you, you must forgive them. Proverbs 27.6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Right? So if I say something and it cuts deep, you know, Pastor Tanya always likes to say, Hey, curl up your toes. I'm going to say this. It's probably going to hurt your toes, right? This is, the, I'm going to step on your toe. <laughs> okay, that's faithfulness. Faithful 
are the wounds of a friend. And I'm telling you, you, you need to hear it. You need to hear it. There isn't a person alive who doesn't need to hear these very sharp words. You must forgive and you must do so totally. There is no level of maturity or spiritual enlightenment that you will achieve where these words become less important. This is the most fundamental teaching in the New Testament. It really is. No matter what line of work you're in or level of maturity, you too may find yourself filled with so much hurt and so much bitterness that it begins to hinder your daily life and begins to hinder your life with God. And guys, scarring your conscience is not true forgiveness, right? Like often we act in a way where we're like, you know, we just hurt after hurt after hurt. And then instead of dealing with those wounds, we allow them to scar on our hearts. And then we become uh, not forgiving of people, but, but we, we, um, we just start to become indifferent about people. Indifference is not forgiveness. And we're going to talk more about that as, as we move on. And that's a pretty hard thing to deal with because indifference means I've scarred my heart. You're right. Like if you like, you hear about somebody, Hey, have you forgiven so-and-so? And you're like, I just don't even care about so-and-so like whatever they can do this. They can do that. They can live, they can die. They can be successful. They can, they can be unsuccessful. Like whatever. It doesn't mean anything to me. That's indifference. And that is a sign of a scarred conscience, right? That's not forgiveness. Okay, so um, many of us have heard uh, John 13.35. I'm going to put this in the chat dialogue for you guys so you guys can see it with your own eyes. John 13.35 says, By this all people know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And I'll put this one in here as well. Matthew 6.21 says, And forgive our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. So think about that. We are going to talk more about this in the, in the weeks to come, uh, in depth, but just think about this. What does it mean? We're asking God for forgiveness and we're saying our prayer is that he would forgive us likewise, just as we have forgiven our debtors. So the real question isn't what's the forgiveness level from God. The real question is how have you forgiven your debtors? What, what's the level of forgiveness you have to your debtors. And that, that will be, that's the level you're praying for. That's what Jesus said in the model prayer. So we hear these scriptures and we agree with them, but at the same time, we seem to reason, right? We like, oh, well, nobody's perfect, right? That, you know, the bitterness in my heart isn't any worse than the sins that other people commit. It can't be right. Like we're all people. And after all, God understands and, and sympathizes with, with my situation, right? Guys, let me just be really honest with you. This is exactly how the enemy traps us into rationalizing our sinful attitudes and behaviors. Okay? We got to be honest. I know you guys have heard me preaching that from the pulpit. Like, we got to be honest with God. We got to be honest with the Holy Spirit. And when we begin to, to rationalize our sinful attitudes and behaviors, we are, we are one step away from deception. I mean, think about it. Have you guys ever lamented to the Holy Spirit about a situation? You know, like complained to the Holy Spirit about a situation. And, and you're like, you know, you're hoping that he would sympathize with you and take your side. And you're like telling him like, here's what happened. One, two, three. And this is why I'm so right. And this is why this person's so wrong. And, and you know, we kind, of, we kind of expect him to fill us with pleasant feelings and say something like, Oh, you're right to be so angry. Tell me more about the problem. Go ahead, get it out of your system. But the Holy Spirit's not going to tell you anything of the sort. Likely, what you're going to hear is the Holy Spirit say, you must totally forgive them. And you're going to say, like, I can't. You you don't understand. I I can't. And the Holy Spirit's going to say, you can. You can and you must it's like not even an option, you know, and then still it's like, you know, I don't know if you guys are anything like me, but still a little, you know, hard hearted, like, well, let me tell you a little bit more Holy Spirit. Cause you, you, I didn't tell you this one part. I didn't, I didn't tell you this one thing I was trying to, I, I was trying to save a little face for them, but I, you know, and we, we try to, you know, to convince the Holy Spirit that like, Hey, look, we're, we're right. But the Holy Spirit is like solid, like a rock. He's just going to stick on his point. You must Totally forgive them, release them, and you will be set free. It is the hardest thing. I know, guys, I know. It's the hardest thing you may ever be asked to do, and it will likely be the greatest thing 
that you're ever asked to do. So when it happens, when you do, when you enter into this, this place of peace, this place of forgiveness, this, this like peace comes, this all-encompassing peace comes. When you decide in your heart to forgive those who wronged you totally, you will experience, I promise you, you will experience a new depth of peace in your heart, a peace like, like you've never experienced. Setting people free, forgiving them, letting them off the hook, it's a wonderful feeling. It truly is. But if you start to think about it, you know, we get like, I don't know about you guys. It happens to me like when I'm in the shower, like for whatever reason, I start thinking about what those people did and then I start to argue with them, you know, your shower arguments and you're like, you say all these like super profound things and I'm like, oh, I should write that down and like, look how, <laughs> look how right I am, these, you know, shower arguments. But when you think on it too much, when you think about what those people did for too long, you become churned up inside. It actually like ugh, starts to, churn up and you say things, you start to think things like, man, this isn't fair. How come they're not going to get caught? They're, they're, how, come no, how come they're not getting punished? Nobody's going to find out. Nobody's going to know. This isn't right. And all of a sudden, the peace of God just lifts from your life. And there you are, like in anxiety and frustration. You got all this bile churned up in your belly. And Let me see if you can relate to this cycle. When I allow the spirit of total forgiveness to rule and reign in my heart, the, the peace of God would return to me. But when I would dwell with resentment uh, on the likelihood that these people would never get caught or never be found out, the peace would just leave. It's kind of a nasty cycle. I, I, I don't know if you guys can relate. But if you can, you've got a really important decision to make. Just ask yourself, which, which do you prefer? The, do I prefer the peace or do I prefer the bitterness? Because you can't have it both ways. You can't hold on to the bitterness and experience God's peace. And you can't experience God's peace and think that you can also hold on to bitterness. You can't have, have it both ways. And in most cases, you'll find out that your bitterness is not damaging to anybody else but yourself. When we're bitter we delude ourselves into thinking that those who hurt us are more likely to be punished as long as we're set on revenge. And there's a real fear. There's an honest fear. If, if we're going to be honest with each other, there's a real fear in letting go of those feelings. Well, what if I let those feelings go? Nobody's ever going to know. What if I let those feelings go? They're, they're completely off the hook. If I let those feelings go, I'm saying that I agree with what they did. That's what we think, right? The, those, those are the lies. And we make ourselves believe that it's up to us to keep the offense alive. Like, I have to be the champion of this offense so I can keep it alive. I want you guys to look at Romans uh, 12 and verse 19. I'm gonna, I'll put this in the chat dialogue. Check this out. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Guys, the word says vengeance is mine. That word mine, it's very, very strong language. You know what it means? It means it's God's, right? Like it's his. Full stop, period, end of story, it belongs to God. And for us to take vengeance is to try to take something out of God's hand. And I don't know how you guys feel. I'm not trying to humanize God, but I don't know how you guys feel when somebody tries to take something out of your hand that belongs to you. But um, God's not having it, right? It is. Vengeance is his. We only hurt ourselves when we dwell on what has happened. And, and when we fantasize about what it'll be like when they get punished, ooh, when they get theirs, we're the ones who get hurt. But worse than that, in my opinion, worse than that, is that we grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And that's exactly when we lose our sense of peace. When we grieve the Holy Spirit, we lose the sense of peace. So today starts your journey. Th this, was, this was my big sell for you guys. You're going to find out that you need to commit daily to forgive those who have hurt you 
and forgive them totally. You're going to have good days. You're going to have bad days. You're going to have days where you've forgotten about it completely and you're going to think, hey, I've arrived. I'm good. I don't have to deal with that anymore. I've totally forgiven this person. And then some random Wednesday, something's going to happen while you're at, walking around the aisle at Hobby Lobby and, you know, all of a sudden you're going to be hit with all these feelings and, and wanting to, you know, oh, <laughs> go back into the stuff. And you got to go back to your commitment to forgive those people and let them off the hook. And here's the thing, you guys. You need to resign yourself to this knowledge. I'm, I'm going to put this over here so you guys can see it. You need to resign yourself to this knowledge. These three things. If, if, you, if you can't reconcile with these three things, there's no point in you continuing this class. In order for this journey to be profitable to you, you have to resign yourself to this knowledge. They won't get caught or found out. No one will ever know what they did. And they will prosper and be blessed as if they had done no wrong. Those are the three facts. You've got to reconcile with those first b before you can even move on with this. And I promise you guys that if you walk this out, if you walk this journey out with us, you will actually begin to will these things for them. You will will for them that they wouldn't get caught. You will will for them that nobody would know what they did. You would will for them to prosper and be blessed. And you will do it with an honest heart, not because you're feeling like, oh, this is the, the Christian thing that I have to do. But when we walk out total forgiveness, that's exactly what happens. So I'm going to challenge you guys to ask God to forgive them and do this every day to keep that peace in your heart. There's nothing, there's nothing that's more valuable or should be than the peace of God in your heart. And having been on both sides, I don't know. I think everyone can agree. Peace is better. Peace is better. And bitterness is never worth it. Okay. How are we doing, you guys? How's everybody feeling? You guys doing okay? I just want to check in real quick because, um, okay, hang on. I can only, I can, I'm scrolling through. Hey, Kyle Kirk's in the house. Hey, Kyle Kirk. Hi, Dana Erdman. Hey, guys. I don't know when you guys joined us, but um, welcome. Thanks for being here. Kyle's at the church for some reason. What's he doing over there? Um, okay. So, um, Anyways, welcome you guys. I'm going to I'm going to continue on and can you guys hear me okay? Am I blasting through everybody's headphones? It's good. You just fine. <laughs> Thank you Adam and Ashley. Thank you. Appreciate you guys. Thumbs up from Adam and Ashley. Amen. God bless you guys. Thanks. I can hear you fine. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks guys for being here. We love you. Thank you so much. This is really this is really um I am so thankful that you guys are here for this. I'm telling you, I think this is the most important teaching. This is the teaching of the hour. This is the most important teaching in the church today. And, and um, you know, w I, th I think you'll find that that's true as we move on in the weeks ahead. And I strongly encourage you guys to use those teacher guides and um, to go through and, and, and do an honest journal. Nobody's going to read it. I'm not ever going to ask you to share that journal with the group. That is your journal. It's personal. It's private. It's just for you. You don't have to worry about anybody reading it. I'm never going to ask you to expose it. Um, but there is there's something about putting this stuff down in writing. Answer these questions honestly. If you want to get the most out of this class, do those journals. There's no right and wrong answer. You know, if you want a one-word answer in your journal, then go for it. Nobody's, you know, there's no, there's no word requirements. You can do whatever you want. But to really get the most out of it, go through and answer those, um, answer those personal refl reflection questions. It will really, really help. Okay. So we're, if you're following along in the student guide, we're, we're moving into class number two, when it hurts to forgive. The only way to move beyond the hurt and to go forward in life is through total forgiveness. It's the, guys, it's the only way. It's the only way to, to move beyond the hurt. That hurt will never go away. I hate, I hate to sound like the bearer of bad news. It's never going to go away. You can't medicate it. Um, you can't ignore it. You can't try to fill that space with like a, a great hobby or pour a bunch of different friends into it. If you're going to move beyond hurt and go forward in life, you've got to go through total forgiveness. And, and this theme of total forgiveness is, I believe, more critically needed at this time 
than nearly any other teaching in, in the Bible, honestly. And too few of us were taught how to properly forgive when we were young. I think if we pulled around the room, uh, this Zoom room, and asked you guys, like, who here had lessons on forgiveness when they were growing up? You know, maybe your parents might have given you, like, oh, you know, forgive, and, you know, it's better to forgive, or, you know, maybe not. Yeah, Tanya's shaking her head no. Pastor Tanya's like, no, my parents were like, go get them, you know, <laughs> whatever, you know. So, uh, you know, it's like, ah, dog eat dog, just get out there and do So very, very few of us were taught how to properly forgive when we were young, and most people never feel significantly bothered by the unforgiveness that they harbor in their hearts, even as adults. They're like, man, whatever, that's just the way it is. But the truth is, if you don't totally forgive, you grieve the Holy Spirit of God, perhaps in a very small way, in a way that may seem like it goes unnoticed. However, even godly parents miss the opportunity to to teach this in the home sometimes. And so because of that, many pastors who were raised by parents, oddly enough, Many pastors and mentors and leaders do not emphasize forgiveness as a lifestyle. You guys, in in the early days of the church, uh, matter of fact, up until like a couple hundred years ago, there were like three big dogs. There were three things you were going to hear about in church. You were going to hear about salvation. uh, You were going to hear about uh, prayer. And you were going to hear about forgiveness. Those were like the three things that it's like (laughs) pounded every other, every Sunday. But somewhere along the line, I don't know, probably about a couple hundred years ago, maybe 150 years ago, for whatever reason, we stopped talking about it. People stopped teaching on it. And and even well-meaning counselors, man, I'm telling you, these secular counselors, boy, they suggest things like, well, treat those who hurt you with contempt or give them the cold shoulder, teach them a lesson. They must be punished, you know, like other things of that sort, like all this like worldly idea of like how we deal with unforgiveness. And and the, the doctrine of forgiveness is so obvious in scripture that it's hard to believe that adequate teaching has lied dormant and and untaught for hundreds of years and we should probably repent for our neglecting to teach it it's this is this is part of it for me i've you know this is the second time i've taught it this year um i'm just man i just when you when you realize the need for it and the lack of teaching on it and the freedom that comes with it you're like why aren't we talking about this and it makes so much sense why the enemy's doing his best to keep it out of our lives, to keep us from teaching it and studying it and practicing it. This subject will change our lives. Had this teaching been been the, the emphasis and, and, and lifestyle of all of us who were in church leadership, I got I to gotta be honest with you guys. There might not be so much division in the church. You know what I mean? I know, it's tough. There might not be so much hurt in the church. There might not be so much strife that has characterized Christian circles. I mean, it's such a sad thing. Why does that why does that have to be our story? Why does why does this characterize Christianity for so many people? Division and hurt and strife and 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 that cuts me to the quick. Like because it's my job to teach it, you know, and it's the church's job to teach it. And and in some instances of, of unforgiveness may may often be described as a battle for truth, right? Like somebody's like, oh, I'm just, I'm holding on to the truth or I believe in the truth at all costs, but you know, really the the veneer is paper thin, honestly. Underneath, if you just peel it back, it's this age old lie, it's jealousy, it's it's pettiness, it's agendas, it's, it's sheer humanity, sheer humanness, the, the, the humanness that affects us all. That's really what's what's underneath it. So let's talk about forgiving difficult things. Because forgiving those who have severely hurt us can be a very difficult task, and I mean that, you guys. My heart goes out to you, and and I'm sure yours goes out to me as well, because if you've been put in that position, man, you know it's tough. You know it's tough, especially it's amplified tough when trust has been shattered, you know? So it's helpful to speak of it in degrees or different types of forgiveness, so there are four different types of forgiveness. I'm going to just copy these real quick and put them in the chat box for you guys. Boom. 
Here you go. So there's four different types of forgiveness. There's detached forgiveness, limited forgiveness, full forgiveness, and then there's total forgiveness. So detached forgiveness is where there's uh, a reduction of negative feelings. There's still a bunch of negative feelings, but they've been reduced significantly. Um, but no reconciliation has taken place. And um, do you guys know what uh, reconciliation is, right? It's when, when you were not friends, you were friends, and then you were not friends, and then you became friends again, okay? So limited forgiveness, that's where there's a reduction of negative feelings toward the offender, and the relationship is partially restored, though there is a decrease in the emotional intensity of the relationship. It's just like we're still friends, but we're, we're just not friends like we were. We're not close like we were. Then there's full forgiveness. Now, full, forg full forgiveness is where there is a total cessation of negative feelings toward the offender. Like, you got nothing. You're like, I don't feel negatively about this person at all. And the relationship is fully restored. Now, I say restored on purpose. I didn't say reconciled. I didn't say the relationship was reconciled. There's a huge difference between relationships being restored and relationships being reconciled. And um, you don't have to, here's a huge, huge, cool glass of water. Total forgiveness is not dependent upon being reconciled. So I'm telling you guys, you don't have to reconcile with somebody. You don't have to be somebody's friend um, that that you're, you know, you're not friends with as a result of something that happened. Total forgiveness doesn't mean to be reconciled. You can have a fully restored relationship and also not be reconciled. Now, if you want to reconcile, that's great. Um, we're all for it. That's totally great. It, there's not, I'm not saying you shouldn't reconcile. That's wonderful. It's lovely. It's beautiful. Wonderful. But it's not possible in every case. You know, say the person that you forgive is, uh, you know, in another another part of the world. Like, it's going to be difficult for you guys to be fully reconciled. Well, can you be fully restored? Absolutely. Well, what about if the person you need to forgive is dead? They're, they're not even in this world anymore, right? So how can you possibly be reconciled? So you say, well, I guess I can't be in total forgiveness because I can't reconcile. No, that's not true. You can be fully restored. It doesn't have to mean you, it doesn't mean you have to be reconciled with that person. So I think it's very, very important to understand that total forgiveness isn't about you guys going through this lesson and then hanging up the phone and calling the people that uh, are rightfully outside of your boundaries and inviting them back into your gates. That would be unwise. I'm not telling you to do that. Okay. So you can be fully restored and walk in total forgiveness and still not be reconciled with an individual. Of course, I'm definitely pro-reconciliation. If that happens, it's awesome. I'm just not telling you that that's a prerequisite in order to be walking in total forgiveness. And that's what we're going to be talking about in this study, the forgiveness that must happen in the heart. And when that happens, peace emerges. And what matters is that the Holy Spirit is able to dwell in us ungrieved. We want the Holy Spirit to dwell in our lives in an un hindered way, that he would be totally and utterly himself. The degree to which the Holy Spirit is himself in us will be the same degree to which we are like Jesus and carry out his teachings, which is kind of the point of our existence, right? So now you might think, you might think that it's impossible to forgive an unfaithful spouse or an abusive parent you may feel like you can't forgive what some evil person did to your son or your daughter. You know, how can we forgive a church leader who took advantage of their position and spiritually abused us? Or what about the person who lied about us? What about the person who, who believed those lies? You know, the list of potential offenses is endless. There's just so much opportunity to be offended. But listen, no matter how grievous the offense, it's a hard truth to face. You must totally forgive. It's the only way you will ever find freedom. It's the only way you will ever find true release from the offense. Now, there is 
there is a bit of selfishness when it comes to forgiving somebody else. So it does, it does kind of serve me a little bit. I'm going to explain. Um, you know, it's not just about like, you know, dying to myself and, and da- taking up my cross daily. It is about those things. But there's also kind of a selfish side of, of forgiveness, and it's beneficial to me. So uh, it makes sense when I understand it. It makes sense. Like, I, I want to forgive these people because it's better for me. You know, <laughs> like, uh, this person's not even in my life anymore. I'm not going to carry this unforgiveness because it's better for me not to. At, th- at the foot of Jesus' cross, think about this guy. Remember, rem- remember when, when he was crucified, no one felt very sorry, right? There was a couple people at the foot of the cross. Uh, his mom was there. Mary Magdalene was there. Um, I think uh, John was there. But other than that, like, no, nobody was feeling sorry for him. I mean, there was no justice at his trial. I mean, if you can even call it a trial, if you guys go back and read those scriptures, like, what a joke, right? And there was, like, this perverse glee that filled the faces of the people who demanded his death. Mark, Mark 15, 13 said they shouted. They were shouting, crucify him. They, it was like they wanted it. They, they wanted it to happen. They were like, yeah, Friday night fights. Let's see it. Let's get bloody. Crucify him. You know, it's like, ugh, awful. And furthermore, Mark 15, 29 through 30 says that those that were passing by were hurling abuse at him. So, I mean, think about it. This guy's dying. He's hanging on a cross. He's dying. And people are passing by, insulting him, shaking their, their heads and saying, oh, you said you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days and save yourself by coming down from the cross. God, can you imagine? I just, yeah, it breaks my heart to, to think about it. But what was Jesus' response? I mean, if he's the pattern man, if he's the example, I mean, this is, this is the man that could have called down hellfire from heaven and just, like, zapped everybody like bugs. You know, what was his response? Luke 23, 34, it says, But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. They don't know. He just had grace for them. He had love for them. And this has to be our response as well. This has to be. The ultimate proof that total forgiveness has taken place is not when relationships are reconciled, but when they are restored. And they're restored when we sincerely petition the Father to let those who have hurt us off the hook. That's how you know a relationship's been restored. Okay? I'm not talking about reconciliation. I'm talking about restoration. The relationship is restored when we can honestly go to the Father in prayer and ask him, God, please let that person off the hook. Don't hold this sin against them. They've got enough sins in their life. I've got enough sins in my life. I don't need any other extra sins holding me back. Don't hold this one against them. Now think about your godly desire for revival. And, and I hope that you guys all have one. I hope you guys are, I hope you guys are revival-minded. We should all want revival within our own households. We should want our brothers and our sisters and our fathers and our mothers. and We, we should want all of them to be in heaven with us. We, we want revival in our house, don't you? I do. We, we want revival in our church family. Don't we? We want our church to grow. We want Strong Tower to be healthy and vibrant and, and alive and, and move people getting saved. You know, like families coming in and we, we want it to be, we want revival in our church. We want revival in our community, don't we? Wouldn't it be awesome just to see this whole city like, wow, what's going on in Casper? This is like the holiest city in the world. This is, this is crazy. We, we want revival in our nation, don't we? I'm, look, Man, I want a White House that reflects the glory of God. I want a White House that stands for what's true, what biblical truth, uh, or at the very least, what the founding documents say, um, because you know they were written out of the Bible. So we, we want revival. We want revival in our household. We want vi- revival in our church family, revival in our community, revival in our nation. Now, what if, now hear me out, what if that revival hinged on whether or not you were able to totally forgive that person. Think about it. If you think about that for too long, 
it might make you feel awful. It might make you feel selfish. It might even make you feel trapped. But the reality remains that you have to make a decision whether or not you want revival, what it's worth to you, whether or not you want the Holy Spirit in his fullness. You want the Holy Spirit in his fullness in your family. You want the Holy Spirit in his fullness in our churches, in our community, in our nation. You guys got to choose, and you can choose right now, right where you're sitting. You can choose right now what means more to you. Getting even with someone who has hurt you or receiving the blessing of God. Receiving the blessing of the Holy Spirit. Those are your choices. I know it's like, oh, I want more choices. <laughs> but those are, those are our choices. We, we get to choose. And the, the choice is yours. Do, do we want revenge? I mean, how, how bad was it? And obviously, you should opt for the latter. Even if your prayer has a selfish explanation, you don't want it on your conscience that you held up the blessing of the Spirit when all around you, the family of God is praying for it. Think about it. Let's, let's just say, I'll use my family for example. Let's just say that, that my, I and Pastor Tanya and Heaven and Raiden, my kids, were all praying uh, for uh, my, my mother-in-law, Tanya's mom, who, who she saved. But let's just say, for example, let's just say that we were praying for her to be born again. But Heaven had some odd with her. And she's got this unforgiveness in her heart. And here we are, we're all praying for her, her salvation. And that very salvation could be hindered because we are not in a prayer of agreement because somebody has secret unforgiveness in their heart. Do you see how sneaky this is, you guys? So everybody around you, everybody in your family, is, we're praying for it. We're praying for Strong Tower to be healthy. Guys, we got to forgive one another. Look, the, the truth is uh, I'm going to offend you guys at some point, um, and you're probably going to offend each other. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do? Are we going to divide and just go, well, you know, I'll just do the American thing and just go find another church? Is that, is that what we're going to do? I hope not. I hope that, I hope that we can grow up beyond, beyond our little childhood um, ideas and, and just say, hey, we're real people on a real journey, and sometimes, you know, we're going to rub each other the wrong way. And, and that's just the reality. You guys, we're, we're, hopefully we all walk together on this journey for the next however long, right? Uh, however long, maybe our whole lives. Maybe we spend our whole lives together at Strong Tower. Wouldn't that be awesome? I think that would be awesome. So I don't think it's possible to really spend your whole life with another person and never get sideways with them. So we're going to have to figure out how, how we're going to deal with that. So the motivation to forgive often has a selfish explanation. Jesus will speak to us in the way that gets our attention if only by appealing to our self-interest. And let me be really specific with you guys. Uh, Matthew 7.1. Go ahead and look at this. It says, do not judge so that you will not be judged. I mean, one selfish motive for not judging others is to keep from being judged ourselves. If a person's chief desire is a greater anointing, and we should all want a greater anointing, we should all want a closer relationship with God, we should all want that, that level of intimacy with God, and we're told that this anointing will come in proportion to the degree that he forgives others, we would be much more motivated to forgive wouldn't we? We should all desire greater anointing. So it's not entirely selfless when we forgive other people. Like I'm forgiving other people because I want a greater anointing. I want to go deeper with God. There's some, there's some self-interest in it for me. Also, the Bible says, as the Lord forgives you. I'm going to put Colossians 3.13 on your screen for you guys. Check this out. <clears throat> he says, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. That's us, guys. That's us. Bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, check this out. You must do also. You must. As in, this is not an option. You must. 
How has the Lord forgiven you? That's the real question. If I must forgive somebody like the Lord forgave me, then I want to know, how did the Lord forgive me? Well, he forgave me unequivocally. He forgave me unconditionally. Your sins will never be held against you. Nobody will ever know what you did. And aren't you glad for that? I know I am. I know I am. All right, listen to Psalm 103, verse 12. I'm going to put that one in there. Psalm 103, verse 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our wrongdoings from us. So it follows that you should not hold people responsible for what they've done to you. You should hold nothing against them. You should not tell other people about what somebody did to you. Not even your closest friends. Like, oh, I just love going out to coffee with you because we can just dish about everything. No, you shouldn't tell your closest friends. You shouldn't tell anybody what they did to you. And you might be thinking, well, what about sharing with my pastor? Can I share, can I share this with my pastor? Can, can't I share this with my mentor? First and foremost, and hear me, first and foremost, you should examine your heart. Examine your heart. Why are you sharing? Are you sharing maliciously? Are you sharing with the intent to start a campaign against that other person? Be honest. Be honest with yourself. Are you seeking sympathy? Are you just trying to vent? Now, your, your mentor, you know, we're humans. Your mentor may erroneously encourage this behavior. Oh, just talk to me. Just get it out, right? But that's due to lack of teaching. That's due to lack of study. It's due to lack of revelation. Remember, I told you guys there's been like over 200 years, 150 years at least, of nobody teaching on this. So that's why we still have this old, we got to upgrade our, we got to upgrade our workings, man. We got to upgrade our, our thinkings on how we deal with this stuff because we're using this old, old platform. And it's, it's not only is it not working for us, it's unbiblical. It's, it's not even biblical, right? So we say, oh, you should just talk about it. it. helps to get it out. It helps to vent. That's a lie, okay? That's a lie. And the reason we believe that it's, it's because we have a lack of teaching and a lack of study and a lack of revelation. Reaccounting these instances in your life is destructive to yourself. And, and secular science agrees with me. It's destructive to yourself to relive these things. It's destructive to your relationship with God to relive these things. And it actually grieves the Holy Spirit. So consider this loving rebuke. You must forgive. And you must forgive totally. And I imagine I've got I've got another example in here for you, um, and we're we're almost through. Um, but I think David must have felt like this one time before he was made king. This is when he was still a young man. He was fully ready to take vengeance on this guy named Nabal. Uh, this man refused to help him in his time of need. But God sent this person named Abigail just in the nick of time to appeal to David's common sense. And and uh, I'll put it I'll put it in there for you. And you guys can read this with me. It's kind of a big chunk here. But it says, Then David said to Abigail, listen what he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me. And blessed be your discernment. And blessed be you who have kept me this day from bloodshed and from avenging myself by my own hand. Verse 34. Nevertheless, As the Lord God of Israel lives, who has restrained me from harming you, if you had not come quickly to meet me, there certainly would not have been left to Nabal until the morning light as much as one male. Wow. If you must tell another person, you're like, Pastor, you don't understand. Okay, first of all, I, I do. I don't, I, I might not fully understand the situation, but I understand the, the position that you're in, right? You're like, Pastor, you don't understand. I got to tell somebody. I, some, I got to tell somebody what happened, okay? That I just can't contain the pain. And I get that, you guys. I get that. But here, here's what I'm asking you to do. Tell only one. Just tell one. Don't, don't, don't tell a bunch of people. If you told your spouse, that's your one. Just tell one. And choose someone who won't repeat it. 
choose someone who would never repeat it. And here's, here's the big ticket. If that person that you choose, when you tell them about it, if that person that you choose, when you tell them, says, brother, sister, you must totally forgive. If they tell you that, I'm telling you, you chose the right person. That's the person that you need to ask. So, Father, we just thank you uh, as, we, as we journey together um, through this really kind of messy and, and uncomfortable topic uh, of forgiveness and unforgiveness. And as we sift through hundreds of years of lack of teaching and, and lack of revelation, God, we just ask that, that, you would f- that you would fill that in us, that you would fill those empty places. God, that, that you would fast forward the, the learning process for us that, that God, we want to be known by you and we want to be known in this world as people who love you and follow you and, and, and follow your precepts. Lord, we're not looking to what the world thinks a Christian should be. God, we want you to define what, what we should be. And we're going to bow our hearts to that, God. We're, we're going we're gonna to bow our hearts to your way and your plan for us. And Lord, we just trust you and we ask you to speak to us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, God bless you guys.